if I'm being 100% honest, like this year that I've had in 2022, this has probably been the worst year of my life literally since that moment in 2015 when I was suicidal. So like, if anything right now, I'm having like my second rock bottom and I'm slowly climbing out of it. And like on Monday, I had my first session with like my therapist. Yeah, I saw that on LinkedIn. So for me, like I'm actually in a moment like right now where I'm like really excited because I've been so depressed. I've been so anxious due to certain things in the last couple of months that have happened that have completely traumatized me. But I'm on the upwards trajectory of that. And now I'm like really excited because I understand that, like, oh, I actually have an insane opportunity here. Like, I actually have an opportunity here that I may not get, like, the same way that you were talking about those people that were 70 and 80 and don't realize that life is giving me another chance to realize it again right now and like go to that next level, you know? But it's very hard, like, especially when you go through something, you're gonna have to go through a period where, like, you have to face that depression, you have to face that anxiety. You have to face like that misery and like that darkness because eventually, like once you like hit rock bottom and you still have like a small hope to live, that becomes the ground. You start to realize, like, oh, literally the only thing I have from here is up. This is Entrepreneur Perspectives, introspective podcast conversations with and for entrepreneurs. This podcast is produced by the team at CadSource. If you are looking to start a podcast, appear on podcasts, or create original content, go to CadSource.com or you can DM me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz. In this conversation, I'm joined by the author of Screw Being Shy, Mark Metry. Mark is an important voice for mental health. He is the host of the Social Anxiety Society podcast. He's a two-time TEDx speaker, and he's someone who has dealt with social anxiety. And today he helps people manage their social anxiety. And he does this through his book, Screw Being Shy, his talks, his posts, his conversations, and his coaching. This is going to be a two-part episode because well, shit happens. Mark's Wi-Fi got taken out during this conversation, but it's all good. The Wi-Fi issues created a great stopping point. We will get to part two soon, but for now, here's my conversation with Mark Metry, where we talk about topics like changing schools, 9-11, diversity, bullying, social pressures, and meditation. Real quick, before we get started, CASCM is our content production company. Why content? It's simple. Content brings people together. I've seen it play out over and over, and I want to help others explore and discover this for themselves. The experience is totally worth it. Learn more at CASCM.com. We focus on podcasts and writing, one piece of content at a time. It all starts with conversations, just like this one. I grew up in like a small town that's like in kind of rural Massachusetts. Okay. I moved to Boston in like 2015. Okay. So you changed schools early on. I think you were in maybe going in a second or third grade. Yeah. Like for my history, I just like remember even before second grade, like moving to like four different schools. Okay. And then eventually settling down after third grade in the town. Why was it because of family? Was it jobs? Was it situations at certain schools? Like why move so much? I think my dad, he got like some kind of like business opportunity there. Oh, and at the beginning for moving around too much. Yeah, I mean, just things were not stable. You know, like my parents came to this country with like $200. Okay. You know, so they were sure. hustling, hustling, hustling. Where did your parents, where are they from? Egypt. Egypt. Okay. Yeah. So as I keep going back to this, I'm thinking back. I have three kids myself. Mm. They've changed schools, especially my oldest. And so I've witnessed as a parent because I didn't change that much, right? I changed one time and then obviously went to college later on. What it's like to transition experience, right? Of to live that experience of changing schools. Like did that in some ways, like obviously, like it seems like your anxiety took off, your social anxiety took off once you changed schools. But looking back on it, what's your take on it right now? I did this psychology class in college. And I remember there was like this whole like human developmental index. And they had like basically taken like, here are the events that are most likely to change someone's development. And I think like in the top five of that list, it was like your parents splitting up, moving to a new school, being bullied, abused, assaulted. Those were like the top factors. You know what I mean? And so that's just something that I think about. And so 
the, what I think about is there are kids who move schools, but they're still able to like do that without many problems, whereas other people struggle a lot with it. You know, so it's an interesting kind of idea. Yeah. Can it be beneficial in a way because you're putting yourself in that uncomfortable situation, no matter what comes from it? Because it's going to be a difficult transition, I think, probably for most people. But perhaps like they realize because change is inevitable in life, right? Maybe not as much when you're younger, but you're going to possibly go to college. You're going to start a new job. You're going to move cities. You're going to move out of your house. Like there's just so many different things that are going to happen. Are there aspects of changing school that could have some benefits? Like you talk about your social anxiety and what you went through and what you're doing today as a superpower. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, man, like as I get older and older and older, I'm starting to realize that like there is no one answer. And it's really just about like multiple ideas coming together that may even be paradoxical and really kind of create like this gray shade of life that is kind of hard for people to accept. And I think that there's pros and cons, right? So I think. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like one person who comes to mind is like, I remember my ex-girlfriend, she moved around a lot, same as me, but she's like a extrovert, has like a great personality. But however, like maybe one of her pros is that because she had to move schools, she had to learn how to be very social. Being social is an amazing skill, right? But then what are the negatives of that? The negatives of that are you don't necessarily have like the stability in your life for your mind to sort of be like, oh yeah, this is the school that I grew up in. And same if like your parents get split up, like, oh, here are my parents or like, here's my home where I always come back to. I feel like that has a strong level of psychological resilience, you know? So I think there's pros and cons. Yeah. I like when you say like, there's not one answer because that's right. Like for so long, like I remember starting businesses and a lot of articles like really early on is like the five ways to do this and the two ways. And it doesn't mean that those things are bad, right? Because I've even had, you've had some episodes where you talk about here's our five things that you can deal with if you uncover an uncomfortable situation, right? And it's not bad, but there's no prescription necessarily. This is a very complex topic. I wish there was. Right? <laughs> this is a very complex topic to sit through and everyone's experience is different. I mean, you just throw in the fact that like, here you go, your parents come from Egypt, you're moving around and you reference this, 9-11 happens. And 9-11 affects us all and it affects us all in many ways. And... What grade were you in in 9-11? I think I was around like second grade, third grade, okay. maybe. Because then you dealt with bullying like right then and you were getting blamed and pushed around and beat up, right? Like <laughs> called crazy. horrible names. Like that was your family's fault, right? All that kind of stuff happened. It's crazy, man. It's so crazy. And like I talked to other people who are like Middle Eastern and Arab like me. And it's like, we all went through some scenario of that that depending on the age you were in, kind of messed you up, depending on the person, you know? Mm -hmm. And I have some friends who are just like me. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very, very common problem, you know? And I feel like it's a very common trend too. Like whatever bad thing in society that happens, whatever country that's like traced back to that gets blamed, you know, whether like right now it's like Russian people or like Chinese people because of COVID, you know? So I think it always happens. And I just like happen to be like right in the middle of that. And then I also happen to live in like a small town where there was like no diversity like whatsoever, you know? And so it was crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Why is it, whether it's changing schools or seeing someone that doesn't look like them, whoever, you know, these kids were at this school, it's like, because they just hadn't seen it before because they weren't cultured. So it's like, what's being talked about at home. And then all of a sudden, this aggression, this anger, this bullying, this, I don't know. Have you read about, <laughs> have you researched this? Have you talked yeah. to you? Like, why is this happening? Yeah. I think there's a few different components. So I think one, there's like a very basic, like primitive biology to it. Malcolm Gladwell, he like wrote this book, I forget the name of it. And he talks about this and he basically talks about how like for thousands of years, a lot of humans kind of like grew up in an area where everybody looked like you. Like in your town, everybody looked like you. Like that's just like how our brains grew up. And so like, that's also why, for example, like immigrants here or people of the same race, like here in America, they're like more likely to congregate together. Right. So like, for example, I remember in high school, I literally had no friends except for one guy who was like literally the only black guy in the entire school, one Hispanic guy who was like literally the only Hispanic guy. Yeah. 
one Asian guy who was the only Asian guy. Shit. And like, we all just hung out, you know? And so I think there's like that kind of very basic biology. And that doesn't mean that it's like an excuse or anything like that. And I think another part of it too is like, you know, when I moved to Boston, for example, I didn't experience any racism anymore. And that's because everybody there is diverse. I also think like politically speaking too, it also matters. Like if you look at the political graphs of like mostly every state, every city is kind of more diverse. They all kind of lean left democratic and every kind of small town is more conservative, kind of right wing. And so I just say that because I definitely think that obviously like there's a lot of great people who I met in that small town. There's a lot of people who have like great values. But at the same time, I also feel like there's this mentality of like, oh, we have kind of been here first, who are like all these new people who are coming here. So I think that definitely has to come into play. And then of course, like 9-11, you're a country being attacked by terrorists. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it is. It's baked into uh, like people's biology almost. It's like you hear about the fear, right? When you know people jump, right? Because it's like a lion might be coming out of the trees and that's baked in or same thing. Like we'd have to fear that. If not, you'd be the one eaten by the lion if you didn't run around the corner, right? So there's all these different things that have already been like pre-established and hardwired into us. At the same time, like you had said, that doesn't give the excuse, right? Because now we've had generations of people that have gone through this and we've had opportunities to listen to people like yourself to learn from this to say like, this is not a proper way to act. But there's also maybe a status thing because let's say there is that one kid who you know there was kids there and said, this is not right. We shouldn't be treating someone like this, but they didn't act on it. Maybe because of social status, because if they do act on it, right? We see it play out in movies all the time that... It's crazy, dude. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I want to say two things on that real Please. quick. Like, I remember, and like, a, for example, like a key trigger for people who have social anxiety is this what I'm about to say. I remember like in fourth grade, there was a period where like I was friends with like two kids and then they were kind of like a part of a bigger friend group. And then that bigger friend group kind of like started to make fun of me, bully me. And then like these two kids who were like my only friends, they ditched me to go join the other friend group. So that's a big part of it. The other part of it too is like, I remember when in 2020 last year, when the whole uh, like George Floyd and Black Lives Matter thing was happening. And that actually like really started to get me to like realize how much like race and racism has to play with like mental health and social anxiety. I remember I made a post about it on my Instagram. And I remember I talked about just like my own experience, just like growing up and being discriminated against because of how I looked and where I came from. And I remember there were like a couple people who commented on my Instagram post who were people who I grew up with in this small town. And I remember there was like this one girl and she said, you know, Mark, I remember being in class with you and like all these people like telling you these things. And then she said something like, but I just like didn't understand like what they were saying or like I didn't get how much it could impact you, you know? And I think that's part of it too. Like I think a lot of the times, especially for example, like if you're a guy, there's like a very natural response to like be masculine and be like, oh, whatever people say, just ignore them, their opinions. But like what a lot of people don't understand is that if you're like in a certain environment, if your nervous system shifts because you're in this certain environment, because of your brain type, like those words can like completely destroy your psychology. And like, it doesn't matter how much you try to ignore it. It doesn't matter how much people try to talk you out of it. That's something that I think our society is just starting to become aware of because of like 80% of, or I think it's 90% of suicides are males. And so many people who end up committing suicide, almost every single one of their family members and friends, they're almost always like, oh my God, like we had no idea this was coming and it's because guys aren't talking about it because they were conditioned to just ignore it, to put some dirt on it. Or, oh, I was bullied too, bro. And look how I came out. You know, there's like all these things that people say mm. that really like undermines people's mental health and gets it for them to focus on it from like a perspective of like, oh, it's your fault. You should feel ashamed about this rather than just like looking at it from a purely like scientific standpoint and being like, no, no, like here's the root cause and like, here's what you need to do about it. Like here's one, two, three, what you need to do about it. Instead, people are told that there's like something wrong with them or, or you know, so on and so forth. So it's super interesting, man. I have like dedicated my entire life to talking about stuff like this. So <laughs> yeah. Well, when did you start going to see someone about this? Like, when did it become aware? Like, because even when you're aware of it, right, you're obviously going through it. Yeah. 
like you said, you could play it off. You might just deal with it. You might self-diagnose. You might self-deal with these things. Did you start seeing a therapist at a young age? No. For me and my kind of background is like, I always had social anxiety. And when I was about 18 and I go off to college, all of a sudden I become like 250 pounds. I become seriously depressed. I start socially isolating myself and I actually become suicidal for about a period of a month. And as I'm going through that, eventually I do talk to like a doctor and a therapist, which has pros and cons. But really, I think for me, like the main thing that I started to understand that helped me shift my perspective was like, it's like this, right? So let's say like you have like a telescope and like you look at it and like you look at the night and you see stars and you see like the moon and stuff like that. If your experience of life, like your actual experience of life, how you experience life from a moment to moment basis, if that's the stars and that's like the night sky and that's the moon, What I started to understand is that like the telescope, the tool that allows you to look in and then experience life is your brain. And so what I mean to say is that before I understood that, I just like live my life every day. And just like whatever my brain told me, whatever I felt, I just went along. I didn't understand that I could do anything about it. I was just living in a like in a box and just rolling along, going to school, doing this, doing that, doing this. And like the moment when I realized that like the muscle that allows me to experience life is actually my brain. And if I can change this muscle, then this will actually change my experience of life. And like one of the biggest reasons why I started to realize that is because when I go off to Boston, right? Nobody's bullying me. Nobody's being racist to me anymore. None of that, right? If anything, people are very nice to me. I'm meeting a lot of people. I'm meeting a lot of great people. But here's the thing, I'm still experiencing like this very low self-esteem. I'm still experiencing the social anxiety. And that got me thinking, like, why am I still experiencing this when I'm not in that same environment? And that's what got me to realize like my brain is like this organ that basically takes my experiences from the past and then assumes that life is gonna work the same way. So then it like changes the muscle of how I feel and how I think to anticipate that. And so when I realized that, that just like completely changed my life because it allowed me to have something that I can control, that I can realistically control, which is my brain. And like after like the months and years that followed, the more that I worked on like my brain health, my mental health, the more I just like literally saw in front of my eyes how like literally my entire life started to change, whether it's from having more energy, being able to talk to people without having social anxiety. And then like becoming a speaker, starting a podcast and my career and all these different things. And so, yeah, that's it, man. (laughs) You had to go to that dark place though to get there because you're saying all this stuff at a very young age to uncover this, right? Because many people will become 40, 60, 80 years old before they realize that they were going through all this and were in maybe, I don't know, denial or can't figure it out what it was. Like for you to discover this as such... Yeah, escapism, exactly. Like at such a young age, like, I mean, obviously, thankfully you did not only for yourself, but for all the people that you're now impacting. Because you talked about the past and I had seen something on Twitter is like, forgiveness is giving up hope of a better past. I'm like thinking like, you can sit here (laughs) and regret your childhood, right? You could regret those days going to school. Like, why did I have to have that experience? Or maybe it's not even regret or like, why did that happen to me? And I don't see it in your, your demeanor, like just the way we're conversing, the way you communicate online, the messages that we have. Like, I don't know what happens when the lights go off at night and you're like thinking like, man, why did that happen? Like, do you ever have those moments going back? But I know you're about to say something too. So like, spin all that together. (laughs) (laughs) Well, dude, what I was about to say is like, listen, like the platform that I've built, like I think for me, the biggest thing is being honest. And if I'm being 100% honest, like this year that I've had in 2022, this has probably been the worst year of my life literally since that moment in 2015 when I was suicidal. So like, if anything right now, I'm having like my second rock bottom and I'm slowly climbing out of it. And like on Monday, I had my first session with like my therapist. Yeah, I saw that on LinkedIn. So for me, like I'm actually in a moment like right now where I'm like really excited because I've been so depressed. I've been so anxious due to certain things in the last couple of months that have happened that have completely traumatized me. But I'm on the upwards trajectory of that. 
And now I'm like really excited because I understand that like, oh, I actually have an insane opportunity here. Like I actually have an opportunity here that I may not get like the same way that you were talking about those people that were 70 and 80 and don't realize that life is giving me another chance to realize it again right now and like go to that next level, you know, but it's very hard. Like, especially when you go through something, you're going to have to go through a period where like you have to face that depression. You have to face that anxiety. You have to face like that misery and like that darkness because eventually like once you like hit rock bottom and you still have like a small hope to live, that becomes the ground. You start to realize like, oh, literally the only thing I have from here is up. But however, for some people, it can also get very dark. And sometimes the rock bottom can be a bottomless pit where you actually get worse and worse and worse. And I saw that myself in the last few months, the beginning of this year. And, you know, I started to do things differently. I had to end a like a toxic relationship that I was in. I started to hang out with my friends more. I started to do new things. I started to like just do new things. For the last two weeks, I've been on like this, what I call like a nervous system reset protocol. So I'm like meditating three times a day. I'm working with like a physical trainer. I'm going to the gym. I'm swimming in my pool. I'm taking these cold showers. I'm taking like this list of supplements. I'm like doing all these different things every single day. And sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes you got to radically change things. So for me, man, I'm just like living my life and I try to share it with people. Yeah. And sometimes I forget that other people are listening and (laughs) paying attention. (laughs) Yeah. Right. You and I talking right now, you didn't know that like maybe there's some people afterwards that are going to hear this and it's going to impact them or it's going to impact me. And I'll share this story with other people as well. And I appreciate you sharing that and like how you're doing today because so often we hear like this person had this situation, right? They went to this dark place and then they figured out and it was just they lived happily ever after. Well, it's just not the case because you go along in life and there's new experiences, good and bad, that we're going to encounter. You know, it's like the basic thing is like, well, be happy. Well, yeah, you're of course, you know, and, you know, have peace of mind or peace from mind. And so you can just live your life. But you go out to the park, you play basketball, you sprain your ankle, or someone sends you a text message that makes you feel bad, or you hear horrible news about something that could send you off. It's like, well, where's that? peace? Where's that happiness at that point? Like you just said, like you've experienced it just seven years later and now you're going through it. But it seems like because you've experienced it, that you know that you could work on it. And I'm like this as well. It's like, sometimes I just want to fix it right now. Right? I've had that. We're like, oh, this situation, well, I can get through this. Well, you can't. It's like a little bit at a time. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. Like You don't have this feeling of, well, I'm going to solve this problem in the next week or through this weekend. Right? Like this is an ongoing battle and you know you can get through it. Yeah. And I think one of the best things too that I've learned is that like it's almost like the same analogy as like breaking your leg. Right. So like if you break your leg, we live in a society where there's like this entire process and system for like you go to the doctor, they do an x-ray, they give you a cast, they give you crutches, you come back in the next month, they give you a different kind of a cast. You come back in the next month, they maybe give you a different kind of a cast. And then like by depending on the injury, there's like this whole process for the bone healing and sort of being wrapped. You need to do the same thing, but when it comes to mental health, right? So like any of these things that we experience that are deeply traumatizing to us, whether it's like at a young age, being discriminated against, being bullied, facing abuse, your parents splitting up, some kind of betrayal happening, being in a toxic relationship, going bankrupt. There's all like these lists of traumatic events. And like when that happens, it's almost like the same thing but your leg doesn't break, but like a part of your brain kind of breaks. Mm. And like you have to be able to put it through this recovery process. But the problem is, is that we just live in a world that's just not there yet. Like we just are not at the level of transparency and education where people can do that. And the problem is, is that if someone doesn't do that, the same way that like, imagine if you break your leg, but you just never go to the doctor. Mm. You know, eventually if you kind of sit there I guess it will kind of heal by itself, but it'll heal and it'll kind of be like dysfunctional. Yeah. It'll kind of be messed up. Like your leg mm. will be messed up. And so, like, when it comes to mental health, the same thing happens. So, like, if you're in a toxic relationship, you get out of it, but then you don't go through that recovery process. Then, like, 10 years from now, when you're in a different relationship, the same signs of the fractures are going to show up in your relationship. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, that's really what it's about. And it's very hard. You know, like, that's why I think that seeking some kind of help, like going to a therapist is very well. Like I think like the therapist that I go to, 
She's also like a doctor. She's also like a holistic therapist. And so I think that people can look at that. I think meditation is like one of the most important things for like healing someone's brain. I'm also a big fan of something called nutritional psychiatry, which is basically the power of changing like how your brain works and the chemicals in your brain through nutrition. And then just like a lot of the basic things, like making sure that you're sleeping well. I also believe in certain supplements that can really help people in this situation. So there's so many different tools, but like you have to put yourself through a recovery process. And it's very hard to do by yourself. It's almost impossible. You almost can't do it by yourself unless you have been through it before. Right. You just brought up meditation. You've said it a few times. You said I, you would be nowhere without meditation. And you took it and you tried different things. There's a lot of judgment around meditation, right? For so long, it was like, <laughs> so what is funny, that, man. right? And then someone's like, well, you, you mentioned using Headspace. And some people, well, that's not real meditation, right? So there's like all these people out there that are, it's like anything else, right? People are experts in everything. At the same time, it's like you said, meditate for a minute, meditate for five minutes. Don't judge it. Don't try to be like, you're not going to figure that thing out. And so you be nowhere without meditation. Like, was that at the time when you started coming out on the other end of this to say, to try it? And people told you like you should try this? Yeah. So for me, my perception of meditation was like, oh, it's just for lazy people, it's for hippies. <laughs> yeah. How do you have time for that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But then I like started to read articles. It's like, oh yeah, LeBron James, mm. Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, mm. meditates every single day. You know, so I started to learn that, like, oh, there are people at the top, like Ray Dalio, there's people at the top of their game who meditate every day. So I honestly I've been meditating regularly almost every day. And then in 2021, last year, I kind of stopped meditating for like the first month, like in January. And then this year, at the beginning of this year, dude, I just stopped meditating for like three months, like straight up two months. Dude, life is so hard when you don't meditate. I honestly like don't know how to live life without meditation. Like life is so hard. It's so hard without meditation. I honestly can't do it. I feel like for me and my brain type, like if I don't meditate, it's crazy. And like, I love what you said about like what's happening now with meditation, like all this commentary. Dude, you have no idea how many conversations I have with just different friends of mine who were like, no, nah, bro, I, I tried meditation and I couldn't clear my mind. Or, you know, when I go for a walk, that's like me meditating. And like, again, I think people should do whatever they want. I interviewed this neuroscientist once, Dr. Rick Hansen, and he said, the best medicine is ultimately the medicine that people are willing to take. I think that's an important note. But yeah, I think meditation is so, so important. And it's so important for so many different reasons. One of them, for example, just like for me that I'm experiencing, and like right now, as a part of like this whole nervous system protocol, I'm actually meditating three times a day. Yesterday, I meditated twice, but I'm trying to meditate three times a day and it's like completely changed like my mental health, like just in the last two weeks. But like one of the very like clear benefits of meditation is that like your psychology, there's a part of it where it's gonna spit up garbage. Right. So, like the average person has 65,000 thoughts a day. Some of these thoughts, you can consider them rational. Some of them are not rational. Some of them have to do with like random things in the past. So, like your psychology is almost like this like machine. And every day when like this engine runs and it spits up like these 65,000 thoughts, a lot of these thoughts, like they're not going to benefit your life. So, a lot of them are trash. So, when you sit down and you meditate for 10 minutes or whatever you have, you're actually giving your chance a brain to just like dump a bunch of like crap out. And I think that's why like a lot of people, they have this false perception of like, oh, well, I can't clear my mind when I meditate. That's literally not the point of it. There are certain meditations, there's many different forms of meditations. But like if you literally sit there and you meditate and you don't like clear your mind once, that's still a success. Like that's still, if your brain is like a muscle, when you do that, that's still like you going to the gym and like flexing your bicep. It's like the same thing. And so like by you literally just sitting down and doing nothing and trying to focus on your breath, and then you see like all this crap that your brain spits out, what happens is throughout the rest of the day, your brain isn't spitting as much crap. One of my favorite things about CadSource is the opportunity to chat with amazing business leaders and entrepreneurs. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to connect, you can find me on LinkedIn or visit us at cadsource.com. Thank you for listening to this CadSource production, Entrepreneur Perspectives, building and protecting your business one podcast at a time. Cadsource.
CASDM is our content production company. Why content? It's simple. Content brings people together. I've seen it play out over and over, and I want to help others explore and discover this for themselves. The experience is totally worth it. Learn more at CASDM.com. We focus on podcasts and writing, one piece of content at a time. It all starts with conversations just like this one.